Hi, welcome back to the second episode in the series, Safe Cracking for Everyone. In this episode, we're going to talk about vulnerabilities, as well as a few minor differences between the different Group 2 safe locks. Now, if you remember in the last episode, when you turn the dial to the contact area, so the contact area is under the nose, that allows the fence to fall on top of the wheel pack. To illustrate that again, imagine these are the wheels, and this is the nose with the fence behind it. The nose, once it's over the contact area, will drop down and allow this fence to come in contact with the wheel pack. Essentially, it is testing to see if the correct combination is dialed. If it is not, the fence will merely rest on top of the wheels. Now, these wheels, even though they might look the same, they are not. Due to manufacturing tolerances, one wheel is going to be bigger than the rest. They're all going to be different sizes. And so if one of them is the biggest wheel, let's say it is this one in back here, and I'll illustrate that by offsetting it a bit just to show a sort of exaggerated example. When this fence goes to rest on top of the wheel pack, it's not going to rest on all the wheels. It will only come in contact with the biggest wheel, whichever one that might be. So in this case, it's only going to rest on the furthest back wheel. And that means this nose will be higher. Now, if I were to turn this wheel so that the, the gate is under where the fence is, then the fence would fall through that gate and rest on top of the next biggest wheel. And that means the nose is going to be lower. And that's very important to remember. Just a short interjection here. I'm going to throw up on screen a picture that really illustrates the point of the wheels being differently uh, sized. So you can see the second wheel in this picture is larger than that third wheel. So the fence is resting only on that second wheel. You can actually see a little gap here where the red arrow is showing space between that third wheel and the fence. So if you imagine that second wheel was spun so the gate is aligned under the fence, that fence would drop lower and rest on the third wheel now. So if the fence is lower since it's all attached to the nose and the whole lever assembly, that nose would be lower too and you can feel that difference in the contact points. Now, the whole idea of safe cracking, at least with group 2 safe locks, hinges on the idea of being able to feel these contact points. So, if you notice the contact area, it's sort of wedge shaped. It gets slimmer the further down you go into it. So you can see here, there's quite a bit of wiggle room with that nose be before it hits the contact points. So there's a pretty big area between these contact points. Now, if that nose was lower, for instance, let's say the largest wheel had the gate under the fence, then that nose will be resting lower in the contact area, and thus there is less wiggle room between the contact points. It would only be able to wiggle just a little bit. Now, being able to feel these contact points means you can feel when there's less wiggle room between them. So, if you were to feel that right contact point at, let's say, 3, and then you spin the dial so that the largest wheel, let's pretend it's the third wheel here, the one most visible, you spin the largest wheel so that the fence is resting over the gate, and then you go to feel the contact point again, and that means you would feel that number to be lower, that right contact point to be lower. And that left contact point would be felt to be higher because those points would close in because there is the less wiggle room between the contact points the lower that nose is. And this is always going to be true. There's always going to be one wheel larger than the others. And no matter what lock you are on, any group 2 lock allows the feeling of these contact points. So essentially, depending on what you dial in, what position you put the wheels in, you can essentially test the contact points, write down where they are felt, and determine whether or not a gate 
the, the gate of the largest wheel, whichever wheel that might be for your particular lock, you can determine when that has the gate under the fence. And that means that is a number in the combination, because remember, when we dial in the correct combination, that aligns all of the gates under the fence. So if a gate is under the fence, that means one of the numbers is dialed in correctly. So this is what enables us to essentially figure out the combination. This is the vulnerability that allows safe cracking to be possible. is because we are able to determine the state of the lock without having to see it, merely through touch, through the dial itself. Now, different locks are going to react a little differently. So most of the time, the change in the contact point will be very small, generally no more than a quarter of an increment. So let's say you have a totally incorrect number dialed into the combination. Let's say you have all the wheels dialed with left rotation, let's say just to 80. But 80 is not any of the numbers in the combination, so there are no gates under the fence. That means that fence will be up extremely high. And then let's say you you dial the, the dial to 30. And let's say 30 is the, the number pertaining to the largest wheel. Let's say the third wheel is largest and the third number in the combination is 30. And then you dial 30 and then you feel the contact point. So now that, that nose is lower because that fence is resting on the next biggest wheel. Everything is just lower and there's more wiggle, there's less wiggle room between the contact points because it's all lower in there. Now the difference you're going to feel, let's say you originally you felt the contact point at 3. Well, when you have the correct number dialed for the largest wheel and you go back to feel the contact point, you're probably only going to feel a difference of a quarter of an increment. So you might feel 2 and 3 quarters instead of 3. And it's very important that you are able to determine this difference when you look at the dial. So it's a little hard to show on camera such a change, but for instance, if you are at 3, exactly right there, you need to be able to tell the difference between this and 2 and 3 quarters. That is the change you are looking for on the dial. That is how much wiggle, the wiggle room between the contact points change when you have a correct number dialed into the lock. And it is a very small change and can be very hard to see and does take practice. But it is there. And that means we are able to successfully follow a certain procedure to figure out what those three numbers are in the combination and in what order they appear in. Now, not all the locks are going to be the same. Some might be harder, even though they are still grouped to. Some might be inadvertently harder. If you look at the way that this wheel is designed for a 6730 or a 6741, you can see there's three holes here. This middle one is the most important. That is called the key change hole. So the way that the combination is set or changed on one of these locks is this inner metal circle, this bronze colored piece, is actually able to rotate inside of this outer metallic shiny metal piece. It's locked in place right now, but the change key, when you insert a change key to change the combination of a safe lock, it goes through this hole. And when you turn it, it releases these two arms you can see through these holes. And that essentially allows this inner circle to rotate. And so when you do that, it essentially changes where in relation this gate is to the inner wheel. So that changes what you would dial on the lock in order to get this gate under the fence. Now there's two arms here, and so they're applying more even pressure to the inner circle than if there were one. Some locks, such as the Lagarde 3330, notoriously known as being a very difficult group 2 lock, operates exactly the same way. It's just that the changing combination mechanism is done differently. There's only one arm, and that one arm is applying a lot more pressure onto that inner circle than these arms are applying. So that more pressure, and only from one direction and from one arm, makes the wheels more oval in shape. To the naked eye, it looks circular. It looks like a pretty good circle. But on a finer level, 
it's actually more oval shaped. And so what that means is if one, if all the wheels are shaped like ovals, if they're all ellipses, then that means when you have the wheels all together, and let's say one of them is going to be bigger at this point. You can see the gate on this front wheel. Now if the wheel in back is an oval, and that oval just so happens to have that hill, that shorter side the, of the oval right here, then it will essentially mask that gate. So that fence is not gonna touch this, this first wheel in front that you see. It's going to be resting on top of here because that is at this point, the largest wheel in the wheel pack. And then if you were to spin so that this, this is where the gate is on the wheel in back. Now this front wheel might have the top of the, the short side of the oval masking that gate so this wheel might also be masked by the oval shaped wheel. So that fence would only rest here on that first wheel and you would not get any effect like I showed earlier where the, the fence would rest further down. So how do you deal with this issue? Well, I'll get into that later, but this is definitely something to keep in mind and also one of the reasons why I recommend you do not start with a Lagarde 3330 as your first lock to manipulate. Uh, there's also a few other minor differences with the Diebold locks, for instance, Group 2 Diebolds. They will have a drive cam, which instead of shaped as it is here, which is the same on a Lagarde as well, then it will be more of a U shape. So it would be a symmetrical cutout, basically, a symmetrical contact area. And so, with, with those, you have to be really careful. And when you feel contact points on die bolts, you wanna make sure you really feel both of them. So see here how one side is a lot more sloped of the contact area? That right contact point is more sloped. So the further down that the nose is in the contact area, you're gonna get a greater change in the right contact point than you will on the left contact point. Die bolts are not made such a way, and they will have an equal change on both the left and right. And that change will be less because there is not as much of a, of a slope there. So that means for the SNG 6730s, the 6741s, or the guards, what you're gonna do is you really only need that right contact point because it has such a great change compared to that left contact point. The left contact point is not as useful. But with the die bolts, you want to make sure you take readings of both contact points because they will both provide together the necessary information and reading just one might lead to such small variations that it is easy to misread.